So Fear Street Part 3 has finally dropped, ending Netflix's little back-to-back -back slasher trilogy experiment and it is, once again, really great. It very well might be the best of a belt a bunch. So that means that Fear Street is like a full-on accomplishment now. Like a noteworthy piece of work. What started as a pretty damn good little gay horror has ended up being a pretty damn great big gay horror. And if you really think about it, it's possibly the best horror trilogy of all time. I know such a statement might sound superfluous on initial hearing, but before you get mad, really think about it. I'm not saying that any of the Fear Street films are necessarily the greatest horror movies ever and could stand toe to toe with something like The Thing or Alien or The Exorcist or The Shining or whatever other film names you want to throw into the hat that often get hotly debated as being the best horror ever, but it's probably the best trilogy. There are no horror franchises that I can think of this consistent in quality for three whole films. There's certainly franchises that run longer than three movies that have three or more films well worth watching. Nightmare on Elm Street, for example, has a really great first film, a really great third film, and a really great seventh film. But a three movie streak that starts on strong footing and just gets arguably stronger every entry? I don't think anyone has managed that before. The closest I'd say we've got to three greats being back to back in a series would be Evil Dead or maybe the Alien franchise. But with Evil Dead it's like, I'm not sure how much that counts as the second remakes the first film in its opening 10 minutes, and the third one, while still extremely fun, is a significant departure in tone, setting and genre. And while still very good, it's debatedly the weak link in the franchise depending on who you ask. Same thing with Alien 3. Huge acclaim behind the first two movies, but one of them is quite a departure in genre and tone. Aliens isn't quite a horror movie so much as it is an action film. And the third film, while I personally am an avid defender of its quality, is often considered a weak link. So strike them out, and what have you got? Well, looking at the obvious horror big names, they all drop off in those first three movies somewhere. But Fear Street? Not only does it only get better, but also because of it being structured in a way where each film is part of a bigger connecting puzzle, each successive film after the first recontextualizes the previous entries to be even better movies. It's wild. We literally just got arguably the greatest horror trilogy ever in a matter of weeks, and its central premise is a gay love story? And while there's plenty of acclaim going around for the series, no one seems to be realising how crazy a deal that is. But anyway, before I go even further on a monumental tangent about how great the trilogy is, having already now done a video on part 1 and part 2, I should probably talk about what it is that makes part 3 work so well. Picking up exactly where our part 2 cliffhanger left off, with main character Dina being mentally swooshed back in time, part 3 takes place mostly in the 17th century with the actors from the original film taking the place of our 1600 settlers in some kind of trippy nightmare vision of the past, with Dina herself occupying the mind and body of the infamous Sarah Fear, the alleged witch everyone in the future believes to have been the reason for the whole curse on Shadyside that caused all of the problems for our heroes previously. Dina gets a brief moment to be shocked at her surroundings before becoming Sarah Fear entirely, like an almost being John Malkovich style passenger in her mind, not here to give input, but here to observe her story through her eyes. And so, Seraphia's story unfolds. A hardworking and friendly member of her small settlers community, Sarah seems a far cry from the wicked witch told of in the stories. However, she does have a profound secret. She's in love with the pastor's daughter, Hannah. After an intimate encounter between the two, the town suddenly starts to experience strange phenomena their foods become rotten, their livestock cannibalistic, and worst of all, the once beloved pasta begins acting extremely strangely, eventually committing a sudden and disturbing act of intense violence at the expense of the town's children. The paranoid, god-fearing settlers suspect foul play and begin to believe that a witch lurks amongst them. And when rumours of Sarah and Hannah's relationship begin to spread, they are quick to accuse the two of witchcraft. With the whole town against them and ready to hang them for their crimes, it's up to Sarah to clear their names, find out the truth of what is happening in the town, save her beloved, and maybe, 
just maybe give these townsfolk the witch that they fear in the process. And it is the events that transpire here, the truths that are uncovered, and the violence that unfolds that will ripple into present day 1994 and present Dina with a chance to finally rid Shady Side of the curse or die trying. So right off the bat, Fear Street 1966 immediately pulls you in by simply just bleeding production values. The fully realised 1966 setting is impressively executed, immersive, and very occasionally wonky accent from our lead aside, carried with excellent performances. It's not just style too, there's a real substance to the setting as well. The change in decade representing not just a visual palette cleanser, but also a change in the type of horror we've come to expect from the series. There's a clear and articulate vision for this world, one far more reflective of the time period. Gone are the gory, action-heavy, crowd-pleasing, chaotic, slashy scares of the first two movies, replaced instead with something more akin to a slow, creeping dread. The pace is far more deliberate, building more slowly and intensely, letting its horrors leak in bit by bit rather than exploding in violent bursts. Where part one opened with a gruesome stabbing, part three opens with the more grounded everyday gruesomeness of Seraphia helping pigs give birth. Where the previous movies had characters talking about killings and murders and curses from the word go, Seraphia's reality begins well, only slowly trickling in the problems. Starting at first with nothing but a town drunk, rambling incoherently of sin and wickedness, but going mostly ignored. Then building to a point of paranoid fear, where things have gone so wrong that people listen and tremble at his nonsense as the world they know slowly falls apart around them. Where the 90s and 80s eras were populated with bouncy, energetic soundtracks reflective of their period, 1966 is instead scored with a beautiful but subtly ominous original soundtrack that blends melodic piano with long, drawn out violin strings that complement the slow tracking camera work. Where bursts of violence in the past would be accompanied with frenetic cuts and framing and intense musical blasts, here instead the camera lingers in an almost creeping manner, focusing not on the moments of violence, but rather their harrowing aftermath. We don't see the pig eat her piglets alive, but we see the remains on the floor. We don't see the cruelty the pasta inflicts on the kids, but the camera pauses on the end result creeping through the consequences with a slow, morbid curiosity. The film really carves out its own identity. While there's definitely some clear influences from things like Robert Eggers' The Witch or the slow unease of something like Midsommar or the first Alien, no one could accuse this entry in the series of resting on your nostalgia goggles. And certainly, with each film now having its own clear direction and uniquely executed vision, no one could accuse the series of being samey either. It's kind of staggering what director Lee Janiak and team have done here the more you think about it. Three really strong sequential movies, all with a unique look, style, setting and direction, with a tight thematic connective tissue that gets developed and cemented further with every entry. I was a little worried actually that this film may be where the themes kind of stumbled. The previous two films had established this really strong commentary on class division, but the way it seemed to be leading made it seem like it was a victim of this division that started all of these problems. And I worried that without proper handling, this would be where the allegory fell apart. But thankfully, they got around this potential pothole in their metaphor pretty cleverly. Unfortunately, I can't talk about that without major spoilers, but at the same time, I really wanna. So if you don't want anything spoiled, just know that I hugely recommend all three films and you should turn off the video and go watch them out if you haven't already. But if you're not bothered about spoilers, then stick around for the deep dive in three, two, one. She rises from beyond the grave to make good men her wicked slaves. Of fucking course it was Sheriff Good all along. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing. This isn't a oh, that was so predictable comment. This is a, that is absolutely the ending this series deserves comment. So look, I wanted on record that I had expressed that I thought this guy was sus before this reveal had came out, due to several bits of what I thought were pretty clever foreshadowing. But my God, am I kicking myself for not being 1 million percent certain of this fact, because on top of the foreshadowing I did notice, 
there was so much I did not that was staring us all right in the face. 20 minutes or so into the first film, this man literally stands on a podium adorned with the devil. He literally is shown to us being elevated above Shady Siders, lifted up by a staring, smiling Satan. Sunnyvale's mascot is fucking Beelzebub himself. How? How in the blue hell, pun intended, did I not know for absolute certain in that moment that this bastard was part of it all along? Revoke my film analysing licence now please, I clearly do not deserve it. Personal crisis aside, the idea that the systemic problems that exist within Shadyside exist specifically as a result of illicit activities from a powerful affluent family that figuratively feed their working class neighbours into a metaphorical meat grinder so that they can build their white picket fences on top of their early graves, all the while claiming that Shadysiders bring their problems onto themselves while being maliciously complicit in the systems that create those problems, ah, it's just... Wow, chef's kisses all round, guys. Like I said prior, I didn't actually think that Seraphia was going to be some completely inhumane monster, but I did have some concerns over her role in the curse being the potential loose thread that made all the symbolism and theming present throughout the trilogy fall apart at the seams. My personal hope was that Seraphia would at least be extremely sympathetic cast in the eyes of others as a witch due to her lesbian relationship, and in being given that role and becoming an outcast, finding strength in it, embracing the labels she's had forced upon her, and becoming a witch herself to take some arguably deserved revenge. It's a narrative of empowerment we can often see in gay media. As recently as this year, we had a huge example of this with Lil Nas X's Montero, a song about the singer's unashamed sexuality with explicit lyrics about enjoying the hell pun intended, out of gay sex, coupled with a video full of religious and satanic imagery that caused… a bit of a stir. Obviously anyone with a modicum of common sense understands the reason for this imagery. You tell gay people they'll go to hell for their sexuality for hundreds of years, don't be surprised and clutch your pearls when they turn around and say, alright fine, you want me to go to hell so bad I will. And this kind of thing Lil Nas X did here with Montero was kind of where I figured they'd be going with Fear Street tell Seraphia her lesbianism makes her wicked, then wicked she shall become. And personally, I'd have been happy with that and I think they knew that's the kind of thing people might be expecting because they even teased that avenue around the midway point, but where they go might be even better. The good family being the true evil behind the scenes makes certain the audience make absolutely no mistake in where their sympathies should lie. This is a tale of systemic oppression at the hands of quote unquote good men. Men who are powerful. Men who are beloved by their wealthy communities. Men who we're supposed to trust. Politicians and policemen. A few good men. Some might say this is a little on the nose. The mantra repeated throughout this third movie's second half in both dialogue and spray paint of good is evil certainly hammers the point home. But I take no issue with this and honestly think it fits well here. The cherry on top of a thematic cake that brings the whole thing together. Yes, the villains literally have the name good, ooh how ironic right? But at the risk of being a little heavy, this is something I think that benefits from being on the nose and spelled out. The themes of this movie and its trilogy remind me a lot of a really powerful quote from Naomi Shulman when she said, nice people made the best Nazis. My mom grew up next to them, they got along, refused to make waves, looked the other way when things got ugly and focused on happier things than politics. They were lovely people who turned their heads as their neighbours were dragged away. You know who weren't nice people? Resistors. Now I am of course not trying to equate the fictional struggles of some Netflix film protagonists to the actual horrendous horrors of one of the single greatest acts of malice ever committed on humankind, but I'm hoping you can see why I'm reminded of that quote at least. In this fictional world, I imagine Sunnyvale is full of nice people, with nice jobs and nice families and nice homes. I imagine some of them feel really bad when they flick on the news and tut quietly to themselves after seeing another shady side tragedy. I imagine they're all really familiar and friendly with the nice Sheriff Good and his nice mayor brother. 
I imagine they'd be perfectly nice to Shady Siders, as Sheriff Good often is shown to be. But that such niceness comes conditionally on the basis that those Shady Siders don't cause them any trouble. So yes, the whole thing is not subtle. It's very on the nose, but it's all the stronger for it. And its bluntness in how significantly it states and hammers home its themes makes the payoff to these revelations so, so satisfying. There was already a lot to like about this film in its 1966 story, but it just keeps giving you reasons to love it when it returns for its conclusion to its present day setting of 1994 to cathartically wrap up this whole tale. I loved the finale set pieces with the callbacks to Carrie and the crazy fun Monster Royal Rumble where all the slashers just go apeshit on each other. I loved the juxtaposition of the modern tone with the 1966 tone, showing how different the delivery of each period was by jumping from McCarthyism paranoia to Home Alone-esque Goosebumps hijinks. But the thing I love most is just how earned its ending feels in both the overt parts and in its subtleties. Obviously, it's extremely satisfying when Sheriff Good finally gets his comeuppance after a long and dangerous struggle. But even before that final killing blow, this film is just empowering you to be ready for it. I really love how the film demonstrates the oncoming shift in power by subverting its own imagery. The last moments of 1966's events where the curse all began depicted a frightened teenage girl fleeing through underground tunnels from a knife-wielding but well-respected and powerful member of the community, who shouts her name as he pursues her with deadly intent. And then in 1994, as things come to close, we see this imagery repeated once more, only now it's the teenage girl who has the knife, and the powerful man is the one fleeing. That's just fucking brilliant, man. And you know how I said in my review of part 2 that it recontextualized the brutally unfair killings of the first film as thematically necessary? Well this film just takes that ball and runs with it. Sarah's final monologue before her death becoming a rallying cry of power for our heroes and their unjust losses. So when we see it montaged with all of the casualties of the past and the words haunt Sheriff Good in his final moments as he comes face to face with the corpses his family have built their empire on before he's stabbed through the eye and ended, oh my god, the justice, the vindication. After seeing so many likeable characters meet unlikable ends, the films have made you a shady cider. You've been right there for their losses across decades. You've been through the feeling of thinking how undeserving these characters are of their fates. You've questioned if these scenes were too much for characters who clearly deserved so much more. You've uncovered the root problem along with the leads, and you finally get to see that chain of misery broken. Montaged alongside images of the fallen and the chilling, echoing words of the system's first victim's promise. The truth came out, and it was so, so satisfying. So it has been a genuine pleasure to review and analyse all of these movies. What an incredible surprise they have been. The ending credits tease more for this franchise, and while part of me kind of thinks it should just stay at this perfectly self-contained trilogy, I have enough faith in everyone involved with this thing now that I truly believe they could make something special once more. Personally, I'd love to see them take aim at the idea that just because a figurehead of a problematic system has been taken down doesn't mean the problem doesn't persist in some way. You know, think of it like how in America there's all these people celebrating about how Trump is gone so everything's fine now, and don't get me wrong, Trump being gone is good, but they're turning a blind eye at his replacement continuing to fund and push some of his most harmful policies. I could totally see them doing something interesting with that, you know, really zoning in on the whole nice people being complacent in horror's idea. They sort of set it up a little at the end of this third film with Sheriff Good's family saying they had no idea he was this awful person, and I'd like to see them tackle that theme and really zone in on it with a sniper scope. I mean the shady side colours are blue and red, and I'm sure that's not unintentional. It'd be interesting if whoever took the book during the end teaser was a shady cider, and it'd be interesting to see how many shady ciders would be okay and turn a blind eye to this new person's crimes just because he's on their team. 
or perhaps even believe that this person fixes problems within the system while continuing to perpetuate the same problems themselves within the same broken system. Anyway, whatever, I'm totally yammering here. I've been Dan Drambles and if you've enjoyed this video then please let me know with a like and a comment and be sure to subscribe to my only Dan's at the red button below. And also, if you'd like to see yourself amongst these credits in future videos as well as gain access to a bunch of other cool stuff and an exclusive Discord, then consider becoming a patron. There's a special offer on right now for the first 100 signups. Check it out. Links in the description. This week, I'd like to give a special shout out to my patrons John Thompson, Sarah Harker, Paul Kissock, and the New World Order and the Illuminati. Thanks for watching. Once again, be sure to subscribe to my OnlyDans, and I'll see you next time.